Hello everyone, this is Andy Weibel and welcome to Timely Topics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about electricity in uh, Muskegon area and the Cobb plant and joining us is the Senior Public Information Director, Roger Morgenstern. Welcome to the show. Thank you Andy, great to be here. Yeah, um, so let's just start with the Cobb plant. It is no longer yeah, it is no longer. The, the building is there, but we're not making power there anymore. In fact, I started my career 18 years ago this spring at the Cobb plant. So it, wow. uh, as a Muskegon resident and, uh, and a uh, person who started the Cobb plant, it's got a special place in my heart. But uh, what we made a decision as a company to close some of our smaller generating plants. Now, to drive by the Cobb plant on the causeway, you don't think small. The yeah, stack 650 <laughs> feet tall, yeah. um, but in generating plant, uh, uh, lingo. It's a relatively small plant and it served uh, our customers in our state very well for almost 70 years but we made the decision to close seven of our smaller generating units around the state including uh, the, the two uh, coal-fired units at Cobb, units four and five. Okay. That was done last April 15th. That was part of an agreement we had with the Environmental Protection Association, the federal EPA. And that was because it was uh, not it met all the current EPA regulations, but on April 15th, tax day, easy to remember, April 15th yeah. last year, additional regulations went into place. So we made the decision that we were going to close the seven smaller units instead of putting additional, Dollar. uh, additional dollars for emission control. It's like putting money into an old car. You know, even in the time that, that I, I, was, I started at the car plant in 99, we put money into that plant uh, to reduce its emissions. And we did over the years uh, to make the air cleaner, but we made a decision that it just didn't make economic sense for our customers to put more money into the plant after, after April 15th, so. Yeah, I've seen some old pictures not long after the Cobb plant was built, and it looked like smoke was billowing out of that. I, I've seen some of those same photos. What, what it was, there, there originally were five units at the Cobb plant, and so they each had a stack. So I've seen some of the old photos too where there, there were five stacks and it's before we had uh, emission control where we would take a lot of the soot out of the, out of the, out of the smoke, if you will, out of the, out of the um, exhaust. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's the way things were back you know, early in the 20th century. I yeah. mean, I'm old enough to remember uh, between uh, plants like the Cobb plant and a lot of the foundries in town, there was kind of an orange haze in Muskegon. Wow. Fortunately, we don't have that anymore right. because of good laws like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. And at the Cobb plant, with the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, when they went into effect in the early 1970s, that's when we built the big stack that everyone sees there now. I think it was built in 1974. Okay. And that became a common stack for all five units. And at the same time, or about the same time, late 60s, I think, we built those big black boxes you see on the top of the plant. Those are called precipitators. That's a fancy word for taking the soot out before it goes up the stack. Okay. So um, we've made improvements and we've made additional improvements even in the time I was there in the early 2000s to burn more natural gas, which is better for the environment mm -hmm. than coal, and also to reduce our emissions. But it just got to a point that it didn't make economic sense to continue. E even with natural gas being much cheaper than it has been in the past, it still didn't make sense? Yeah, one of the challenges with natural gas, specifically at the Cobb plant, we're gas limited. The infrastructure here in Muskegon County doesn't uh, allow us to bring in a lot more natural gas mm -hmm. in this plant. We're really at a, we were really at about the maximum with a we had a 14 inch main that went into the plant. And what we used for natural gas in the last 10 years at Cobb was we used natural gas to uh, light the fire, if you will, start the burners in the boiler to get the, the water heated. And then we introduced coal and that's how we make steam. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing we did, there were three smaller units at the Cobb plant which were uh, shut down, I'm going to have to remember now, here in the early 1990s. And then we repowered them with natural gas back when um, natural gas, the price was even more advantageous than it back in the late 90s. And so we spent money, repowered those three units with natural gas, but really between that and the gas we used to light the fires and the boilers, that's about all the gas we could bring in without making a really big infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, financial investment to bring, m working with our our uh, friends at Mishkan, at D now DTE uh, Gas, to bring more gas into the, into the plant. So that's one of the reasons. A lot of people have asked me, why don't you turn it into a gas plant? We do own gas plants in Zealand and in our hometown of Jackson. But it just, the, again, the investment to get more gas to the plant just didn't make sense for our customers. Okay. And um, 
where do we get our electricity now? Well, we get our electricity from, uh, our CEO used to joke, from the outlet, you know, but <laughs> not, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. But we have, a, we have a interconnected grid. Think of it as the, like the interstate highway system. Uh, they're all connected, and the Cobb plant was part of that grid. Okay. So the, uh, the, the job of the poles, uh, the job of the men and women behind those poles and wires is to keep the voltage the same so that the lights in this studio, the oh, lights point. at home, don't get too bright or too dim. Now, I'm not an engineer. I don't want to get too technical because <laughs> then I'll lose myself. But um, as, part of the, as part of the grid, we made plans. We have been planning this for like the last five years so that we knew the roughly 300 megawatts that would be coming off the system, we could handle that from other generation sources in the state. Okay. Uh, so just because we're here in Muskegon County doesn't mean we get our power from Muskegon County. And that's really been the case for, for decades, time, yeah, yeah. for a very long time. Uh, we, have, um, we have a large plant in West Olive in Ottawa County, the Campbell plant, mm -hmm. uh, that's still operating. We own a gas plant in Zeeland. We have our big, what we call our battery, uh, Ludington Pump Storage up north in Ludington, which is a, a plant that pumps water during the night and then it releases and creates electricity during the day. So we have plants all over the state. We also buy power from, from third-party providers. So we had to, we had to show um, our regulators in Lansing that we, there was enough power on the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about in the next five years to show that we can meet the needs of our customers. Now, we are looking beyond there to see what needs we may have in terms of maybe building additional plants uh, across the state. But um, we made the agreement with the EPA to shut down Cobb and also uh, two similar size units over in Essexville, which is over in uh, Bay County on the Saginaw Bay, mm -hmm. and then uh, three small units in Luna Pier, which is a town in M Monroe County in southeast Michigan. So we do a lot of planning uh, and uh, modeling to make sure we've got enough power. We feel confident we do. But so now we're moving forward with decommissioning these plants, but also looking to see what our, our customers' long-term power needs are. Do you foresee those power needs increasing or um, staying about the same? I we, mean, things are yeah. getting more efficient, but then again, maybe, you know, electric cars might be in our future mm -hmm. more. Well, yeah, like there are in, uh, in our electronic world, you know, we're all plugged into something. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do see uh, small increases, a couple of percent a year increases in electric load. So we are looking at that. We don't see, we don't see right now a large increase on the horizon, but people are being more efficient. One of the things we're doing is promoting our energy efficiency programs. And if people go to consumersenergy.com slash save, they can learn about um, how they can save money at their home, at their business. And for us, if people would say, why are you yeah, telling like your customers? Use, yeah, use, use less gas. Yeah, yeah. Use, less of our, use less of our product. Why, why does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because it allows us from a planning standpoint, we can maybe put off building a big plant, which is a, you know, which is a multi-million, maybe mm -hmm. a billion dollar um, construction project which we as customers end up paying for. So we think by reducing the use or, or, or reducing the increase, if you will, it allows us to, to plan without having to build new power plants because that's a very expensive uh, thing to do. Yeah. What, what about uh, alternative energy such as solar or more probably applicable here would be wind. Yeah. Yep. Is that a possibility for even in the Muskegon area or um, for supplying at least partially? Well, we do have uh, a wind farm in Ludington, uh, mm -hmm. kind of south of Ludington, north of sure. Pentwater. Uh, that has uh, 56 turbines, can create over 100 megawatts of power. And we are looking on the east side of the state, we have, a, we have about, uh, I think, 120 megawatts of power in Tuscola County over in the Thumb. We're looking to just just as a uh, like yeah. 100 megawatts. I mean that might yeah, not mean yeah, a lot. Yeah, to give well, to give you an idea, um, uh, mm -hmm. let me think about this. Uh, one megawatt can power a big box store, okay. uh, a typical like a Meyer, a Walmart, or a Target. To give mm -hmm. you an idea. Okay. So this is a hundred megawatts. So that's a hundred Target stores. That's so pretty good. Yeah, pr pretty good amount of power. Yeah. And and we have about the same amount at our our Crosswinds facility over in Tuscola, but we we already have plans approved to. It, uh, basically double that to over 200 megawatts. So we are looking uh, for more wind development and really in the thumb area of Michigan is, is uh, the studies have shown is the best wind development. Now mm -hmm. I know Muskegon County has looked at the wastewater treatment facility. Mm -hmm. They've done some uh, anometers out there, some, some testing that, you know, I, I can't speak for the county, but I know that's something they're looking at. 
in terms of um, consumers energy uh, we're not one, one of the things with the cop side and we can talk about the future of the cop side but it wouldn't be used for an electric generating facility so there wouldn't be any wind turbines right there right, right. Um, but we are uh, increasing our use of solar energy we have a program called solar gardens which is a community solar program so all of us who are consumers energy customers can sign up to purchase solar energy they don't have you don't have to you know don't have to put a uh, a solar panel on your roof uh, okay. you, you pay a slight premium uh, it, after all the tax credits it's about maybe ten dollars more a month and you can subscribe to solar energy hmm. um, we we uh, open how do you know your energy is coming from that well it's all about how it's div divided up it, the electrons are electrons they yeah. go where they're needed but the idea is we know that our solar uh, uh, farms, if you will, produce so much electricity, mm -hmm. so then we subscribe that electricity. I see. Um, uh, over at Grand Valley in Allendale, mm -hmm. we've partnered with Grand Valley State University on a three megawatt solar farm. I believe the university has subscribed for a megawatt, so um, then the, uh, we're, we're, we're selling subscriptions, if you will, for the other two megawatts. And then there's a one megawatt farm in um, Kalamazoo uh, at the business park that's owned by Western Michigan University. So we're, we've partnered with a couple of universities here in Western Michigan on these solar farms. So right now we've got, we've got four megawatts uh, built. Our plan is to do up to 10 megawatts. So we're looking for other sites in Michigan and uh, uh, we haven't decided where they're going to be yet. But mm -hmm. we are looking at, at more renewable energy because we know that's, that's important to our customers. Uh, they know, uh, you know, we talk about global warming, we talk about carbon footprints, and we're very much about sustainability. One of the phrases we like to use, we like to want, we want to leave things better than we found it. And that's one of the things why we're doing more and more renewable energy, and why we're committed to uh, making the Cobb plant uh, a good site for Muskegon County. Okay, and uh, I want to get back to Cobb, but yeah. one last thing on um, uh, wind energy. You mentioned uh, in, at least in Muskegon, there's been some studies done both in uh, the lake mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, at the water treatment facility area. Um, but you said consumers' energy is not interested in putting wind turbines in there. Um, but if someone would do that, would then they sell that energy as a third party to you? Y and how, yes. how does that work? Yeah, they, they would have what we call a port, uh, power purchase agreement or a PPA. Mm -hmm. And if, if uh, let's say they were to locate on the wastewater uh, treatment plant, which obviously has energy needs, if the, if the power that's generated there is more than what they could use at the wastewater treatment facility, they would have a power purchase agreement with Consumers Energy to sell a portion of the power into the grid, if you will. So mm -hmm. there's a several, there's a, there's uh, numerous legal agreements we'd have to put together. But the location is good from a transmission standpoint. People familiar with the Cobb plant know about the big steel towers that come out of the Cobb plant. Those are transmission lines. Those are owned by another company called ITC. That's the really high voltage. That's the interstate highway, if you will, of mm -hmm. electricity. The higher the voltage, the better it travels long distances. There are, are both uh, 138,000 volt lines and 46,000 volt lines out at wastewater uh, nearby. So that would, would be great from a, from a tapping into the grid, if you will, standpoint. So I see. Yeah, so that's it, a possibility. What if, um, if all your consumers decided, hey, we want to sign on for the renewable energy, mm -hmm. pay the extra $10 a month, would that force your hand in some ways to do more? Yes, it might. Yeah, right now we're planning uh, for 10 megawatts, which is a fair amount of power. Uh, but yeah, if, if we do get uh, you know more interest from our customers, we'll adjust accordingly. Yeah. And, and, and that is that just for solar? Or is it wind as well? Uh, right now it's just for solar. Okay. Yep. The wind is a is a is a different is is, is into our regular rate basis of generating plant. But yeah. Um, what we're finding with solar, we we think the model of what they consider community solar is is better it, because you know there's a cost involved in building these solar plants sure. and the energy that is produced is not as it, it, it's more expensive than producing it through uh, wind or coal or natural gas so that's why we're asking our customers to, to pay, pay, the, pay the extra yeah. huh. um, I, I know Elon Musk has mm -hmm. uh, said maybe we'll have our the shingles in our roof be solar panels in, in our homes 
uh, overall. Maybe, so maybe it'll change. I, I, I really think uh, people like Elon Musk and Tesla and other companies are looking at different things. I know Dow Chemical has looked at solar shingles and you know, how can you know, uh, we power homes uh, independently from the grid mm -hmm. through microgrids, maybe neighborhood grids uh, with neighborhood uh, generators. That's certainly, there, there's a real interesting future in electricity and we think consumers energy will be part of part that of it, because yeah. historically we have built, uh, we and other utilities have built large plants and we have the electricity travel two, 300 miles. We think that's gonna be changing. Hmm. And especially with technology, with energy storage, I was just sharing with somebody uh, yesterday, I think that's the real big next step is being able to store that energy. That's actually something that uh, Musk and Tesla are looking at in right. terms of whole house, uh, whole house battery. Well, we're looking at consumer's energy. How can we even go higher than that? Because you know, we, we deal with large amounts of electricity. How can we store the, the uh, energy from a wind farm mm -hmm. that you know, maybe it's blowing on a day and we're creating more electricity, but it, it's not a real high load day mm -hmm. in terms of electric use. How can you store that How energy? can we store it and then release it on that hot summer day when everyone's yeah. using the air conditioner? Right, when there's no wind and it's hot. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's one nice thing about uh, fossil fuel is it's available anytime. It's, it's constant and the reliability is really high. What, what I think will be the next, big, uh, the next big breakthrough is how we make that renewable energy which is great from an environmental standpoint, making that more reliable. Sure, sure, sure. So let's, let's talk uh, about the Cobb plant mm -hmm. again. And, and well, um, I know you've had some studies done to see what the future mm -hmm. of the plant should look like. So if, if you could just let us know, you know what, what that is. And plus I've heard there's a purchase agreement yeah. for the facility. And so what, what does the future hold for the Cobb plant? Yeah, we're, we're moving on a couple of different fronts. We, uh, we worked with the Muskegon County Board of Commissioners and uh, Windsor Dick, the Regional Planning Commission, on a couple of studies to look at the future use of the site uh, and looking at similar sites around the state and around the country. And what those future use studies are showing, that the best use would be some type of a waterfront industrial development, likely port activities, uh, maybe unloading of, of cargo, you know, not only to ship uh, ship out from Muskegon, but also to bring cargo in. We've been in contact with the agricultural community uh, and, and seen where, where you know, maybe they have goods and services that can be shipped um, uh, out of Muskegon and literally around the world. One, one of the great benefits of, of shipping over the Great Lakes, it gets, it, there's a real, um, there's a real um, backlog of train and truck activity down in the Chicago area. By, by shipping out of Muskegon and possibly going, say, to the port of Milwaukee, you can get on trains in Milwaukee and actually can get out to the West Coast and avoid that bottleneck over in, in the Chicago area. Hmm. So um, we're hopeful that, that the, the economics will be such that the private, the private sector can step forward and, and do that. I think you're gonna, you're gonna see some activity on that yet this year. Um, in terms of the purchaser, we do have a uh, preliminary purchase agreement with a third party, and uh, we, we're not disclosing their name yet because while our board of directors has approved the, uh, for them to purchase the comp plant, because we're le regulated by the state, like I talked before, um, we have to get the Michigan Public Service Commission approval, and we're um, close to filing that, I would say within the next week or two. And once we make that filing, basically it's a request to the Public Service Commission mm -hmm. for their okay to sell this asset. We'll make public that, that uh, plan buyer's uh, name and then they can talk maybe a little bit more about what their long-term uh, use of the plan is. The, the, the short term, uh, the, the site will be taken down uh, and it'll take taken a while. Taken down as in, in this it, it'll it, it, it'll be just yeah deconstructed I think is the really nice word yeah uh, because and we have to deconstruct or or this company does we can't blow it up uh, those of you uh, uh, watching that remember the Occidental Hotel I'm old enough to remember that when they built the Muskegon Mall they blew that up it's really cool and neat to watch well we can't do that at the Cobb plant because there's a lot of dust that that um, mm -hmm. is created by those implosions and there is a large substation there those big steel towel towers are connected to a substation that the at the car plant. That substation is still needed to help maintain the voltage in the West Michigan area. Oh, okay. So we're going to have to destroy that. Yeah, don't want to destroy that. That's a multi-million dollar substation. 
Not a good thing. To, so they'll take it down, uh, if not brick by brick, but they'll take it in, in, in a traditional demolition. Um, and uh, the first thing they need to do is they need to remove a lot of asbestos, uh, which we know is very common in old buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and parts of the comp plan date from the late 40s. So um, they, w th they have maybe five to six months worth of asbestos, what we call asbestos abatement, asbestos removal work that will be done that really won't be visible from, from the causeway, if you will, but right. it's important work that needs to be done to safely take down the buildings. Interesting. And so, um, I, what about other, I mean, how, how contaminated is that area? Well, our I studies, mean, yeah, our studies have shown there is real, uh, from an environmental standpoint, there aren't any major issues. Obviously, there was a large coal pile mm -hmm, there, sure. um, but w the, the plans is, it, what we had done, um, Andy, is we were going down this path of selling to a third party, but if that didn't work out, we had plans in place to do the demolition ourselves. So part of our plan was to, to um, excavate a couple feet below of the, of the coal pile and then put in clean fill. So that would be taken care of. Um, the, the other areas that uh, there, there is some potential contamination are some settling ponds. Um, if people are familiar with the great bike path that goes around Muskegon sure, Lake, sure. the bike path goes right by our, our ash ponds. Mm -hmm. And w the, the sale to this third party will not include those ponds. And we at Consumers are actually working on a plan right now as how we're going to close those. Uh, if we will completely excavate them, if we will close them in place, if you will, and, and place some fill there, we're still doing studies to see how that's going to work. So that's the ash from the coal that you were burning for a mm -hmm. long time, right? Yes, that is, that is actually what we call the, um, uh, the uh, I'm going to get this right, the, the bottom ash. This is the heavier ash that um, we would sluice with water, put it out to these ponds, the ash would then settle, then we would sell a lot of that ash to the road building industry. Uh -huh. And then there's fly ash that's captured by the big black boxes on top, the precipitators, that was captured and um, is taken to a licensed landfill that we own in West Olive. People may recall in the last 10 years, we, we did deposit some of that fly ash in, uh, in an enclosed landfill across the street sure, from the sure, cop plant, yeah. but that was closed, gosh, seven or eight years ago, and now that's, a, that's I should, it's not being trucked anymore, but it was trucked to our Campbell plant down in West Olive. So, so that ash is not there anymore. That, that is correct, yeah. And it was just, so, so can any of this ash that's currently in these ponds, uh, can that leak out into other we, areas? No, we don't, we don't believe so. Uh, you know, they're designed so they're to stay there, uh, stay put, uh, and the, the ash is to settle to the bottom, and then we would take it out. Now, we need to do sampling to see what's in the soil there. Mm -hmm. But our plan right now is to leave those ash ponds uh, without redeveloping that area. So we're still working to see how we would camp it. Is it just too expensive to take it out? Yeah, and it's, it it's very expensive. And we have to look at the expense of that, uh, make sure that it's, it's done correctly environmentally. But we also have to look at the expense uh, that is ultimately borne by all our customers, including you and I. Sure. Um, the other thing we're looking at, there's a channel there right now between the coal pile and the ash pond. That's where our warm water discharge would go into mm -hmm. the Muskegon River and Muskegon Lake. Obviously, the, the water's still there, but there's not, a, there's not a discharge. So we're looking to see if we're going to cap that and fill it and maybe create uh, more additional land for redevelopment, or if we keep that channel um, uh, available. One of the things that's talked about in our future land use studies is maybe using that channel to bring ships in or boats in for uh, repair to maybe make that part of a boat repair facility. Uh, again, another option the new mm -hmm. owner has to look at. So, now, Why would the new owner purchase this facility given all that it has to do? I mean, in demolishing and the asbestos abatement. Mm -hmm. um, are they getting tax breaks or how are they able to do this? Well, it's, it, this, this is, a, as I understand it, uh, the company is specializes in what we call brownfield redevelopment. So they have worked with industrial sites in the past. Mm -hmm. And part of, the, part of the incentive, if you will, they will be able to sell the steel for scrap. And there's a lot of steel in that building. Uh, they can't sell any of the equipment to be reused as equipment, but their scrap value in the, 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 um, the, the, met, the steel that is there, the aluminum, uh, there's a fair amount of copper. So there's some financial uh, benefit for them in terms of 
um, tearing down the building. And then, you know, they're, they're going to try to redevelop it and, and capture, recapture some of their investment uh, with some type of waterfront industrial. You know, what that all looks like is really for, for them to announce, you know, as this gets finalized this sure. spring and summer. Do, is there uh, another area where this has happened that we could look to as to say, hey, this is maybe the future of the Cobb plant? Yeah, there's really nothing in, in uh, Michigan that I'm aware of. Um, this is kind of new for a lot of us. Uh, you know, Detroit Edison, the other big utility in the state, they're in the process of closing down plants. So this mm -hmm. is this is kind of a new thing here in Michigan. All right, so so <laughs> we can't really say. Yeah, stay stay it's tuned. Uh, yeah, all right. But but we're we're very aware, uh, and I'm personally aware as a Muskegon County resident, um, how important it is to do this right, mm -hmm. to make this uh, make this an improvement for the Muskegon uh, the Muskegon Lakeshore and for Muskegon County. So we're working very closely with uh, the leaders at the city of Muskegon and the county of Muskegon to make sure we do it right. We know we've been part of this. We've been we've been part of this community for over a century. Mm -hmm. The cop plant's been there for almost 70 years, and we're going to be here for many years to come. Uh, uh, so we want we're going to be part of this community. We're going to be your electrical provider. We want to do this right. So, yeah. I know they, I'm sure there's a, a lot of uh, excitement in the future, but also a little uh, dismay that loss of jobs mm -hmm. um, and 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 this facility that that, that provided. For, for so many, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, and, and tax dollars, yep. I should say, yep. a lot of tax dollars came from that facility. But um, also, it, it wasn't the prettiest, I think, uh, you know, for, right. for uh, well, looking yeah, at the if, lake. Well, yeah, if we think about the lake and the future, you, you've seen a lot of lakes in in urban areas. They, they've transformed. I mean, look at what's already not on the Muskegon Lake for, and as a lifelong Muskegon County uh, person, we don't have Lakey Foundry. We don't have Teledyne Continental Motors. Right. Uh, we now don't have West Michigan Steel. Even for those who just moved in in the last 10 years, we don't have Sampy anymore. Sure. The, the uses around the lake are changing, and Cobb is is the latest in that in that change. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a loss of tax base. You know, we paid um, uh, over four million dollars in taxes in 2014. That has re been reduced to somewhere, I think, between two and three million. That'll continue to go down as the sure. plan comes down. But we've been working with the city and the county. We've been, you know, trying to do a glide path over the last five years so that they they can obviously sure. it is yeah, they can absorb that that loss. And so we know that's a detriment. When I started there, there was 115 employees at the plant. When we closed it in April, there was close to 60. So we we even attritioned, and that's a loss of income tax revenue, I realize that for the city of Muskegon. Um, fortunately, everyone who was at the plant has either found jobs at other consumers energy facilities or they've elected to retire. So that has worked That's out. Good. That's worked yeah. out well from a personal standpoint. Um, but yeah, we know there's changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the city of Muskegon and Muskegon County has some great industrial park facilities around the county. Um, and, you know, you're seeing industry thrive in other parts of the county. It's just this is a change, uh, but we think it's a change for the better. Um, uh, you know, it's it's ultimately better for the environment. Uh, I think it's better for the look and the feel of the Muskegon Lakefront. Yeah, in the long run. I in think the long run, yeah, yeah. yeah. But change is, change is difficult. Yeah. The change is difficult, and yeah. we're kind of in the throes of that right now. Sure, sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and talking about this. And Happy to uh, do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll be keeping our eye out for future development. It's going to be a busy year. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, thank you everyone for uh, coming into Timely Topics. We've been talking to Roger Morgenstern from Consumers Energy about uh, the Cobb plant and electricity in West Michigan. And uh, until next time, have a great day. Thank you.